I thank you, God, for all that you do, all that you do is good. You always hold true to your word, the truth of your word is I will praise your name, Yahweh, Yahweh. I will praise your name, Yahweh, Yahweh. I will praise your name, Yahweh, Yahweh. Good morning, church. We're so thankful to be together with you in the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. The living God has brought us together today. So pour out your heart and be filled with his peace and presence as we sing and as we pray. If you're able, would you stand with us?
Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. But we will rise again. one church let's sing this together united we believe we believe in god our father we believe in christ the son we believe in the holy spirit our god is three in one we believe in the resurrection that we will rise again And now, Hebrews chapter 12. A huge cloud of witnesses is all around us. So let us throw off everything that stands in our way. Let us throw off any sin that holds on to us so tightly. 
and let us keep on running the race marked out for us. Let us keep looking to Jesus. He is the one who started this journey of faith. And he is the one who completes the journey of faith. He paid no attention to the shame of the cross. He suffered there because of the joy he was looking forward to. Then he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He made it through these attacks by sinners. So think about him. Then you won't get tired. You won't lose hope. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. in light of the resurrection. Let's stand and continue worshiping together.
may be seated. Let us be still and rest with God's word to us from Hebrews chapter 12. King Jesus, you started the journey of faith and you complete it. I am in you and I belong to you. I bring to you the fears that are holding me back from running the race marked out for me. bring to you the troubles that are causing me to feel tired. I bring to you the circumstances that cause me to feel hopeless. King Jesus, You started the journey of faith and you complete it. I am in you and I belong to you. Please help me to keep looking to you. To fix my eyes on you. Carry me safely on the path that you have laid out for me. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit.
what shall we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives, and what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him, there we will rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death. Church, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you are the beginning and the end. You know the day, you know the hour when all of our suffering, when all of our sickness, when all of our worry, when 
all this division will come to an end. Father, we ask while we wait that you unite us as one church in the name of Jesus. Father, that you help us walk the path you have lined out for us in your grace, in your light, and in your joy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Recently during the offering, we have been sharing members' stories and how your giving has impacted their lives. This week, we want you to hear from April. Hi, I'm April, a member of The Crossing. Growing up in my church, I was always taught, you give because it's an act of worship. And I've learned that God gives to us, so we shouldn't expect things back. We need to make sure that we are giving because He's been faithful to us. 2020 has really taught me just to hold things loosely in my plans, my expectations, my life, because anything can be taken from us at any moment. But God is faithful to us, He provides for us, and He loves us, so He's never going to leave us alone. I just want to say thank you to everyone who has given. I've been able to find such a community here at The Crossing within my small groups, with Crossing 20s and women's ministries and Bible studies, and just a friend group to call my own in a place I never thought I'd be. I'm so grateful that you all are allowing the Lord to use you in your giving, and you are allowing Him to show His faithfulness to you throughout all that He's doing in The Crossing community and in the greater Columbia community. If you'd like to give, you can text any amount to the number on your screen. Or you can also safely give online at thecrossingchurch.com. If you're here in person today, we have offering towers as you exit the auditorium. And now let's hear from Keith. Whether you're in person or online, watching with us on Sunday or some other time of the week, I'm glad that you're a part of this worship service with us. At 10.20 in the morning on September 15th, 1963, Robert Chambliss, whose nickname was Dynamite Bob, along with his buddies from the United Klansmen, detonated 100 sticks of dynamite outside the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. The explosion killed four little girls inside and blew out the face of a white Jesus in a stained glass window in this black church in Birmingham. This is the stained glass window, and as you can see, the only part of this window that was damaged was the face of Jesus. In Wales, a group of people heard about this, including a man who had great skill in making stained glass windows. And he took it upon himself to raise funds and to create a window that this 16th Street Baptist Church could use in place of the ones that had been damaged. This is what he sent them, a black Jesus on a cross. A, a, a white Jesus in a black church with the face blown out, replaced by a black Jesus on a cross. It makes us ask a question, or it's made me ask a question recently. And that is, what did Jesus look like? What did Jesus look like? The Bible says very little. The Bible tells us that Zacchaeus was short and Saul and Goliath were tall. It tells us that Joseph was handsome and that Rachel was beautiful. But it tells us almost nothing about the physical appearance of Jesus. We know where Jesus was born, Bethlehem. Where he grew up, Nazareth. We, we know his parents, Mary and Joseph, his aunt and uncle, Zechariah and Elizabeth, his, his cousin John. We know who the Roman emperor was when he was born, Augustus, and when he died, Tiberius. We know uh, his friends and how he died. But we don't know anything about what he looked like. Why? Why does the Bible so quiet on the physical description of Jesus? Does the Bible have something to say to us in that silence? I've been asking questions, what does Jesus look like and why does it matter and how did I get these images in my head? And came across a book, The Color of Christ, that I found fascinating. And it made me realize that I have gotten my image of Jesus from a picture book when I was a kid where Jesus was tall and lanky, white skin, blue eyes, brown hair, 
long brown hair, should I add, and that he, he, he kind of floated when he walked. I mean, he was so holy, he didn't even really touch the ground. When you think of Jesus, when you imagine him in your head, something comes to your mind. Where did you get that image? Why that image? A lot of intelligent people have a lot of misconceptions about Jesus. Uh, Megan Kelly, national news anchor, said this in an interview on the air. She said, Jesus was a white man too. He's a historical figure. That's a verifiable fact. As is Santa. She was talking about St. Nicholas. I just want kids to know that. It's a verifiable fact that Jesus was white. But what if it's a verifiable fact that Jesus wasn't white? See, I think, before you make fun of Megyn Kelly, I think that a lot of people, maybe even a lot of people in this room, regardless of your race, have in your mind an image of Jesus that fits hers, that of a white man. Now, now why do we think of Jesus that way? Well, it's a pretty interesting story, and like every good story, it has a lot of twists and turns. And, and one of the things that's unexpected in the story of why we think of Jesus as white comes from a forged letter. It's called Publius Lentulus, which I know is a super weird name, but Publius Lentulus was supposedly the name of a Roman government official in the first century who supposedly wrote this letter to another Roman official. And in that letter, he described Jesus. Now, there's lots of supposedlies in there because it turns out none of it is true. There was no Roman official named Publius Lentulus. And this letter was not written in the first century. It was a forged letter written sometime between the 11th and 14th century. But it did contain a very vivid description of Jesus and then link that physical description to a certain set of moral qualities. Here's what this forged document said. Remember, it purports to be written in the first century. It purports to give us an accurate description of Jesus. He is a man of medium size, venerable aspect, and his beholders are those who look at him, can both fear and love him. His hair is of the color of the ripe hazelnut, straight down to the ears, but below the ears wavy and curled, with a bluish and bright reflection flowing over his shoulders. It's parted in two on the top of his head after the pattern of the Nazarenes. His brow is smooth and very cheerful, with a face without wrinkle or spot, embellished by a slightly reddish complexion. His nose and mouth are faultless. His beard is abundant of the color of his hair, not long, but divided at the chin. His aspect is simple and mature. His eyes are changeable and bright. So where did this letter come from? Well, it said it was written in the first century. False. It was written somewhere probably around the 12th century. It was said that it was written in the Middle East. False. It was written in Europe. And can you uh, 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 be surprised that a letter describing Jesus' physical appearance, a letter that was written in Europe, makes Jesus sound very European? And that forged document that you've never heard of has a tremendous impact on how you think about Jesus. Because while you've never heard of it, it has impacted art. It's impacted how we've thought about him. Uh, fast forward to the United States in America. The, the group and the person that has pushed a picture, an image of white Jesus the most, is Joseph Smith and the Mormons. In 1820, Joseph Smith says that he has a vision of God in upstate New York. By 18, early 1830s, he's written it down and said that God appeared to him as a bright light. By the early 1840s, he now says, okay, no, I'm updating it. It wasn't a bright light. It was Jesus. White skin, blue eyes, long brown hair. And the Mormons, although they were a small and embattled group, they pushed that vision of Jesus everywhere they went, putting it on, in magazines and everything that they created. Now, one group, one group that was not buying a white Jesus were the Native Americans. 
there's a Shawnee warrior named uh, Tecumseh. I think I'm pronouncing his name right, Tecumseh. And he is talking, he's negotiating with William Henry Harrison, who would go on to be the president of the United States and, and hold the record for the shortest term in office. He died about 30 days into his, his, his presidency of probably pneumonia. But Tecumseh says to William Henry Harrison, back when he was a general, he said, how can we have confidence in white people when Jesus Christ came upon the earth and you killed him and nailed him on a cross? See, Tecumseh is going, look, why should I trust white people when you killed your own God? And you'll have to forgive Tecumseh for being a little bit confused as the white men chased and killed him and took their land, but at the same time told them about another white man, Jesus, that died to save them. He was, to put it mildly, a little bit confused about how that worked. So the first American to ever explicitly criticize a white Jesus and tie that vision of a white Jesus to racism was a man named Apis. 1833, he's a member of the Pequot tribe. He lives in the northeastern part of the country. His mom was a slave. How did Apis know that Jesus wasn't a white man? Well, he said it's pretty obvious that Jesus was a Middle Eastern first century Jew. In other words, he was a person probably with brown skin that looked more like Apis's than white skin that looked like us. The same not only goes for Jesus, but also for his apostles. So where do we get this image in our head then? If it's not rooted in reality, where did we come by it? I think a lot of us came by it like I did as a kid in picture books or film or art or you know, movies, whatever it is. But for a lot of us, it started in Sunday school. In the 1880s, there's a Christian publishing house that creates these little lesson cards. And on the front of the card is a picture of a biblical scene, often of Jesus. And on the back of the card is a Bible lesson. So, for example, here is one of those cards a white Jesus playing with these little children. The, 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 these same cards had other pictures of Jesus, but he was always white. By the way, it also says, it also had pictures of Adam and Eve. They too, shocker, were white, and Eve had long blonde hair. Doubtful for a Middle Eastern woman. Fast forward to 1957. 1957, Dr. Martin Luther King has an advice column. It's syndicated in newspapers, and it's called Advice for Living. He would receive questions and then give back answers. So, so he gets a question that I think is pretty interesting. It's the question we're wrestling with this morning, or at least a variation of it. And his answer, I, I think, in some sense makes sense if you've read much of Dr. King. But on the other hand, it doesn't quite make sense. Let, let, let me show you. Here's the question. Why did God make Jesus white when the majority of the people in the world are non-white? So that's the question he gets, and, and he, he gives an answer that I think you would kind of expect from Dr. King if you've read him. Here's the answer. The color of Jesus' skin is, is of little or no consequence. The whiteness or blackness of one's skin is a biological quality, which has nothing to do with the intrinsic value of the personality. So I say that sounds like Dr. Keene because it sounds like it when he said uh, we, we judge a person not based on their, their color but on the content of their character, right? But he, he, he goes on in the same answer, talking about Jesus. He says he would have been no more significant if his skin had been black. He is of no less significant because his skin was white. See, this is what blows me away, is that Dr. King understood Jesus also to be a white man. But did he have biblical basis for that? No. But that shows you the power of these images, doesn't it? It shows you the power of the images that were so common as he grew up and lived life and as a kid and then as an adult. These powerful images shape people's mind of what they think that Jesus is like so that even Dr. King says, well, yeah, he's a white man. Perhaps, perhaps the image that is the, 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 had the most profound impact on us comes from a guy named Warner Salman. He was a Midwest painter, lived in Chicago. So it's 1941, and he, uh, as part of his job responsibilities, is commissioned to paint a, a picture of Christ. 
And here's what he comes up with. It's called the head of Christ. This is the most reproduced image in the world. My hunch is, is that you've seen this image before. You're going, yeah, that's Jesus, right? 500 million reproductions as of the 1990s. They took little cards of this and they gave it to soldiers when they went off to World War II so they'd have a picture of Jesus with them. And this Jesus p- appeared on calendars and, and lamps and stickers and Bibles and buttons. And Billy Graham even used a picture of this Jesus on his billboards advertising his crusades. But this isn't the only image of Jesus that's out there. Other groups made their uh, uh, art also. Here is a picture uh, of the early 1800s of a black Jesus. A black Jesus being crucified on a cross, but the scene looks a lot like a lynching. Here this artist is trying to communicate that, that Jesus identifies with the marginalized. In the late uh, 60s, there's race wars in, in Detroit. And this Jesus appeared outside of a Catholic church. It was white then, and every night it would go back and forth between being painted black and white until the church said, you know, given our community, we will keep this Jesus black. But that's the wrestling match that has existed. Uh, what does Jesus look like? Political groups make Jesus in, in the image that, they, uh, uh, that helps their cause. So here is a picture of socialist Jesus. This is the image that was made by the socialist workers, the blue-collar workers who are fighting against the government. And here you have outlaw Jesus. This is a wanted po- poster where Jesus looks like the tough guy, the rebel. He's wanted, it says, for sedition, criminal anarchy, and vagrancy, conspiring to overthrow the government. There's other Jesus, though. Here is the, the, the kind of Jesus people Jesus, right? And these are the people in the 70s who, who, who were taken with Jesus' long hair because that gave them validation that men could have long hair and that God was okay with it. But this Jesus, he looks like a California surfer, doesn't he? But there's all kinds of Jesuses out there. This Jesus was painted by a young girl who said that she had visions from God and that through these visions she knew what Jesus looked like. And while I would say she's a fantastic artist, I'm not sure that she saw this Jesus. I I don't know. But it all leaves us questions of what did Jesus look like? Well, you know what it turns out? It turns out that now we have skeletal remains of of Middle Eastern Palestinian Jews in the first century. It turns out through archaeology, we can tell you a lot about how people of a given time period look, their, their body type, their shape, their height, their weight, their features. And with the help of artificial intelligence and all this archaeology and study, we can tell you that Jesus, as a man of that time period, was probably somewhere between 5'1 and 5'5. He he probably weighed between 110 and 130 pounds. He might have been a bit more muscular than the average man, given that he worked as a construction worker who often had to work with stone. He worked outside, his face was probably weathered, and he may have very well appeared older than he was. The BBC, along with uh, other scholars, put together an image, again, based on the, the, all the archaeological skeletal evidence. And here's what they say Jesus may very well have looked like. Impressed? What you expected? Who you see when you pray to Jesus? No, no, and no. Now, no one's saying this is exactly what Jesus looked like, but we're saying that that based on all the evidence that we have, this is what a typical first century Palestinian Jew would have looked like. And that's who Jesus was. When Jesus walked down the street, if you had never seen him, would you know who he was? Like, oh, the glow, the holy glow, that must be him? No. No, for sure not. 
Matthew chapter 26, they're on their way to arrest Jesus. While he, Jesus, was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was the large crowd. They got their swords. They got their, 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 their weapons. They're getting ready to arrest Jesus. And what does Judas say to him? Next. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Now think about it for a second. Why did Judas have to have a sign, a signal? Why did he have to go up and kiss him and say, arrest the guy I kissed? Because nobody knew who he was. Because all the people who were coming out to arrest Jesus had no idea who Jesus was. He didn't have a holy glow. It wasn't obvious who he was. He blended in with everybody else. Why does any of this matter? Well, you might say, so what? Okay, great, but so what? Well, in our country, in our country, the dominant view of Jesus has been a white Jesus. And unfortunately, that image, that false image of a white Jesus has done a lot of damage. Unfortunately, sadly, tragically, this, this false image that Jesus was white has, I, has allowed some people to idealize whiteness. To say that because God came and because God came in Jesus as a white person, therefore white is good and non-white isn't. Not everybody's saying that. I get it. But our history shows that a lot of people have. All the way back in the 1890s, though, there's this Presbyterian minister in New York who gets it right. He says, the conventional heads of Christ uh, are the manufacturer of the merest fancy. So he says, look, all these people painting their vision of Jesus, they're just making it up, he says. God set Christ forth as a man, and not as any particular man, that he may not be localized or nationalized. If he were particularized and localized, if, for example, he were made a man with a pale face, then the man with the ebony face would feel that there was a great, greater distance between Christ and him than between Christ and his white brother. As it is, there is neither white nor black in Jesus. He is a man, that is all. And wherever you find a man, black or white, Christ is his brother. See, maybe it's not an accident that Jesus is not physically described. Maybe it's not an oversight. Maybe that's part of God's plan to say that God is calling a people from everywhere. Maybe it's God's way of saying that in God's kingdom, God's people will be multilingual and multiracial and multicultural. So I have a friend here, as a member here, you might know him, his name's Luke Neal. He's the area director for Young Life, great organization. And he was telling me the other day about how he took a bunch of high school kids to camp. And the camp theme that week was, who is Jesus? And so the first night, the person's talking about who Jesus is, and then they have a cabin discussion afterwards. And Luke said he found himself sitting with a group of, of black high school guys that he had brought from Columbia, and he was talking to them about Jesus. And he said, I don't know why, it just dawned on me to say, hey guys, what do you think Jesus looked like? And every single, single one of these black high school students described Jesus as a white man. And Luke said, no, 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 that's not even historically accurate, not at all. And he went on to explain some of the things that we talked about today. And he said, if anything, Jesus probably had brown skin. He, he, he probably looked more like you than me, but, you know, different than either one of us. And, and, and Luke describes the eyes of these black high school students opening up. He, he describes the change in their whole disposition toward that whole week of wanting to know who Jesus was when they realized that they had something in common with him. Another problem, of course, is that we tend to make Jesus in our own image. Stephen Prothero, a professor in Boston, says, in the book of Genesis, God creates humans in his own image. In the United States, Americans have created Jesus over and over again in theirs. God created us in his image and we return the favor. 
Albert Durer, 16th century German artist, he paints a picture of his face and Jesus' face blended together. Well, what's he saying there? Is Jesus like me? Or maybe it's a critique, a critique that we tend to make Jesus in our own image, in our image. Have you ever noticed that Jesus, in your, in your mind, likes the things you like, likes the people you like, conveniently doesn't like the people that you don't like? So there's a Jesus out there that's not the real Jesus, not the historical Jesus, not the Jesus of the gospel, but one that we make, that it likes the things we like. The Republicans have a Republican Jesus. The Democrats have a Democrat Jesus and everything in between. But what if instead the real Jesus stood up? What if instead we didn't get to know, uh, instead of getting to know the, these false Jesuses of our imagination, we got to know the real Jesus in the Bible, the one that's calling people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, the one that loves all people regardless of their race or their gender or their economic status. That Jesus is more powerful. That Jesus is more beautiful. That's the Jesus that forgives. That's the Jesus that heals. That's the Jesus Jesus that reconciles people to himself and people one to another. But the power is not in the imagined Jesus that, that we come up with. The power is not in the Jesus that you and I have made in our own image. We must go back to the Gospels and get to know the real Jesus. And when we do, we will find our hearts attracted to him like never before. Would you pray with me? Oh, Jesus, we open our hearts, we open our minds, we want to know you. We repent of all the ways that we have, have mischaracterized you. We repent of all the ways that we've tried to make you like us. No, we want to become like you. And so, Jesus, we pray that you would reveal yourself to us in the Scriptures. May we know you and love you and follow you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Being a part of a church is more than just the worship service. It's also serving and being connected to other people. A couple super quick things. One if you would like to, to, to be equipped to how to handle the holidays, maybe you've lost someone, grief share, or you've been divorced recently, divorce care, there's in-person and online options. We'd love to help you. Uh, we also have something called Operation Christmas Child. And this is a chance for us as a church to rally and to help kids all across the world have a special Christmas and meet Christ this Christmas. And then finally, we need Sunday morning volunteers. More people are coming back, and that's fantastic. But we also need a little more help. We need it really everywhere. So anything you see uh, is available, ushers and cafe. And, but here's the thing. The guy told me today, we, we really need the most are donut workers. Now, come on, people. You can, you can beat all the selfish people to the donuts and feel good about it, right? So you get your pick. Uh, here's what you do. If you're interested in any of these, there's too many details here. Just text INFO to 65201. INFO to 65201. We'll send you the details. Please stand to receive God's blessing. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you believe the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us today. Have a great Sunday.